Good morning, good morning, Monday, Monday, Monday morning, and the start of another week, work week. Hope you had a great weekend. Today's chapter is chapter 10. The Crucifix. If you're just joining us, we're reading from The Key to Solomon's Key, Secret of Magic and Masonry. Is this the lost symbol of masonry or secrets of magic and masonry? Chapter 10. Chapter 10, The Crucifix. <laughs> I have my own sound effects this morning. Uh, it starts with an epigram from Pope Leo X, 1513 to 1521, who said in uh, liturgical uh, Latin, it has served us well, this myth of Christ. We may never know the details of the Templars' cr cultural cross-pollination, if any, with the Ishmaelite order of the assassins or other Middle East Eastern sects or philosophies. History informs us that throughout the 12th century, the Templars were fierce and formidable warriors who time and time again distinguished themselves in battle against the Saracen forces. It is equally clear that during the years of occupation and eventual decay of the European presence in the Holy Land, the Templars enjoyed from time to time a diplomatic, if not patently cooperative relationship with the Moslem locals and because of the ease by which the Templars acclimated themselves to their Oriental environment, rumors circulated of a secret alliance. Whether true or not, in legend and popular and later Masonic imagination, the Templars became almost superheroes or supervillains, masters of the magical arts, the Kabbalah, demon evocation, alchemy, even sexual magic. Several of these traditions, sex magic not included, are not so subtly touched upon in the York and Scottish rites of Freemasonry, where degrees concerning the return of the children of Israel from Babylon are heavily peppered with references to the Kabbalah, and juxtaposed with ceremonies concerning the Knights Templar. Obviously, Masonry doesn't venerate the Templars because of their supposed sorceries, or because they were sodomites, or because they perhaps spat on crucifixes. It is nonetheless a well-known fact that they were accused of and confessed to doing all those things. Still, the craft reveres this disgraced and banished order, even to the point of institutionalizing the Templar ideal to young men in the Demolay order. I'm a Demolay. It is true that as Templars grew rich and powerful, they also grew arrogant. But it's clear to me that from their inception in 1118 until their destruction in 1314, the Knights Templar remained men of faith who considered themselves Christians and believed most fervently in God. I am, however, suggesting that their secret made it impossible for them to continue in good conscience to embrace the authority of the Bible and certain doctrines of the Church of Rome. Doctrines that demanded from Christians an unquestioning and unhealthy faith in things the Templars knew 
and believed they could prove to be false. We only speculated, we can only speculate exactly which church doctrines they rejected, but if there's even a scrap of truth hidden in the testimonies extracted through torture, that we are led to conclude they despised, in particular, the veneration of the crucifix. Recall that a number of knights confessed that when they were received into the order, they were required to spit upon and trample a crucifix underfoot, and they were ordered not to worship the crucifix. This is one of the most shocking accusations leveled at the Templars by the Inquisition and contributed heavily to their reputation as black magicians. We must, however, remember that there's a profound difference between the symbol of a cross, which in its many forms has been a venerated symbol since prehistoric times, and that of a crucifix, a cross displaying a dead and bloodied corpse. It's also significant to, the, to point out that the cross, a simple equal arm device, did not appear in Christian art until the middle of the 5th century CE, Christian era. And that scenes of the crucifixion didn't appear in Christian art until the 7th century CE. Prior to this, the symbol of Christianity was the fish, and the image most often associated with Jesus was that of a shepherd carrying a lamb. Recall also that these same knights testified they were told at their initiation that Jesus was a man who died like all men die. This opinion was also common among first century Christians, including the father of James, the biological brother of Jesus. He taught, among other things, that the simple act of following Jesus' example and applying his teachings to one's life was the way to salvation. This was not, however, the view of 12th century Church of Rome, which propagated the doctrines of original sin and, get this, total depravity of man. That's a, quite a name for a doctrine total depravity of man. And the doctrine of the imminent physical resurrection of all the buried corpses in the world. These doctrines were inventions of Paul, a man who never met Jesus. A man whom first cent century Christians of the first century church in Jerusalem, led by James, had significant and perhaps even violent disagreements. For nearly 500 years after the deaths of James and Paul, Christianity was enmeshed in a major ideological conflicts. These were fights over what would become the fundamental tenets of the faith. Eventually, it came down to a bitter clash between two radically different factions. At the heart of the conflict was a disagreement about who exactly Jesus was and what made him important. 
Oddly enough, the debate didn't focus directly on Jesus as Messiah or his teachings, but upon the person of Adam and the doctrine of Adam's guilt or original sin. On one hand, there were those who more or less took the position of the early Christian church in Jerusalem, the remnants of the original followers of Jesus. They considered Jesus a holy man, a martyred master, whose bloodline marked him for kingly or priestly destiny. But their view of original sin was basically that they believed that Adam's sin hurt no one but himself and not the entire human race. He would have died whether he sinned or not. They believed that babies are born in the same innocent state as Adam before his big mistake. And as such, humanity doesn't need a sacrificial offering such as Jesus' crucifixion or a demonstrable miracle such as being raised from the dead to achieve salvation. A religion based on this fundamental premise saw Christianity as a natural evolution from Old Testament law to the new law of the gospel. It'd be a rather simple faith that strictly observed the law of Moses and revered the life and teachings of Jesus, the Anointed One. A religion that taught that salvation is earned by following the example of the Good Shepherd and doing good and obeying what he called the greatest commandment of both the Old and New Testament. Quote, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Unquote. Opposing this, was a religion invented almost entirely by Paul that relegated to insignificance the sermons and the fundamental teachings of Jesus. The teachings ultimately became irrelevant because Paul believed that due to the curse of Adam's sin, we all are born guilty and come into the world already stained with sin, condemned to die, and poised to suffer an eternity of torment. This sin of being born cannot be removed by performing good works or adhering to any law. Indeed, according to Paul, only one thing can remove the curse blood, the atoning blood of a crucified God made flesh. This extension of the animal sacrifice motif of the Jews was based on Paul's metaphysical obfuscation of events surrounding the execution and the reported resurrection of Jesus. Just as the blood of a slaughtered lamb was used in temple worship services to absolve the devotee of certain sins, Paul positive that Jesus was the Lamb of God and that the blood of the God-man Christ can, under certain circumstances, absolve us from the sin of Adam. This is who Paul tells us Jesus was. This is what Paul tells us Jesus ultimately came to do. Not to preach, not to teach, not to serve as an example, but to die. The blood-drenched body of Jesus nailed to a crucifix was the perfect symbol for this suicidal act of blood sacrifice. 
In order for our sin to be removed, Paul taught we must first surrender our natural self-esteem. By consciously and verbally confessing, we believe that because we were born sinners, we are guilty and deserving of eternal damnation. After accepting this identity, we must then exhibit complete and absolute faith that Jesus was God incarnate, who came to earth to take upon himself the sufferings that we deserve for the spiritual crime of being born, and that his death, physical resurrection, and his bodily ascension into the sky were all objective historical events. To this unquestioning faith, Paul added one more condition to salvation, the grace of God. Just exactly what grace is remains an ongoing debate, but according to Paul, there's nothing we can do to earn it. We either have it when we are born or we don't. Without grace, we are damned to an eternity in hell, no matter how good we are in life or how strongly we believe in Christ. For the elect who enjoy the grace of God, there is no crime too hideous, no sin too evil that can exempt us from salvation. The doctrine that salvation is achieved apart from good works and righteous behavior is totally unique to Paul and is found nowhere else in Scripture. It is totally alien to the example of Jesus' life and the words of his ministry. It is the complete antithesis of the position held by James, the brother of Jesus, and his church in Jerusalem. It would also appear that it would be at odds with the Masonic doctrine that tells us that a fund of science and industry is implanted in man for the best, most salutary, and most beneficent purposes. Yet Paul's doctrine would eventually win out, at least for the Church of Rome. In the fifth century, largely due to the brilliant powers of persuasion of St. Augustine of Hippo, 534 to 430 uh, of the Christian era, Christianity became, in essence, Pollyanity. Paul's radical doctrines of the total depravity of man and original sin would, throughout the Dark Ages, define the nature of the human soul and be the canon of a ruthless and powerful church. A church whose doctrines of self-loathing were symbolized by the intimidating and terrible instrument of sadistic torture and death, the crucifix. I appreciate the reader's patience for suffering through this brief excursion through church history and the twists and turns of dogma and doctrine. I did so not to bore you or to persuade you in any way concerning matters of faith, which should always remain a matter of personal conscience. I did so to set the stage, so to speak, for what I am now about to say about the Knights Templar. I believe that at his initiation, the Knights Templar candidate was indeed called upon to spit upon a crucifix and trample it underfoot. 
I believe he was required to do so not as an act of black magic or to abjure the divinity of Christ, but rather to purposefully desecrate the symbol of what the order believed to be a monstrous perversion of the truth. A lie born of a chain of lies that reached back a thousand years before the death of the crucified Savior. A lie that outraged natural reason and common sense. A lie that made us hate our very existence. A lie that blinded the masses of Western civilization to the profound spiritual beauties of the teachings and example of the holy man from Galilee. A lie that nailed humanity's spirit and self-esteem upon a cross of guilt and shame. Furthermore, I hear the echo of this attitude in Masonry's traditional antagonism toward temporal tyranny, in its militant stand against ignorance and superstition, in its legendary enmity toward oppressive religion, in its exaltation of the arts, and sciences, in its call for a rational homage to deity, and in its unambiguous affirmation in the inherent goodness in humankind. Yes, I believe that at his initiation, the Knights Templar candidate did indeed spit upon a crucifix and trample it underfoot. And I believe by doing so, he was taking the first step towards challenging the lie and freeing his soul. And that's the end of chapter 10. Tomorrow, we'll pick up the chapter simply called Sorcery. I hope you're enjoying these little excerpts from The Key to Solomon's Key, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Until then, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under wealth.